Welcome to Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast. Hi, I'm Stefan Busemann. Welcome to Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast. Your stories, your project, the difference you make. One, two. Welcome to Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast. I'm Jeffrey A. McGuire. You can call me Jam. And this is where we celebrate the Typo 3 community, sharing your stories, talking about your projects and the difference you make in, around, and with Typo 3 CMS. In this episode, I speak with Stefan Busemann. Stefan began Typo 3 in 2005, rapidly became a Typo 3 freelance developer, and then a Typo 3 agency founder and owner around 2010. In that time and since then, he's been a huge contributor to the project in many ways, and today he's still a Typo3 Association board member, a member of the Typo3 Company Supervisory Board, and a member of the Typo3.org website team. In our conversation, we go into open source project sustainability, international expansion and project governance, and so very much more. Recently, we had some data loss and recovery issues around the podcast. I had to fix all that to get the latest Season 2 episodes produced, and I am so glad to be back on a regular schedule again now. We recorded this conversation in late 2020, deep in the pandemic here in Germany, and the last 10 minutes or so of this episode were really interesting but didn't quite fit in with the flow of the rest. Listen right to the end for Stefan's thoughts on remote work versus nice offices and in-person sprints. All in all, I think this is a warm, wonderful, and informative conversation with a warm and wonderful Typo 3 human. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed talking with Stefan. Stefan, how long have you been using Typo3 and how did you discover it? It's a good question. I think it was in my in the company I was employed many years ago. I was working in a consultant agency. We had a, an own website, of course. And I was tired of paying agencies just for um, changing some words and pictures. And um, I thought there must be a better way. And I think it was at the end of 2004 when I asked my apprentice to look for a system. And he found Typo3 and he and himself attended the first Typo3 conference in Karlsruhe, which was in 2005. Nice. And he came back and he was so delighted and said, hey, this is a great community, a great tool, and we need to introduce this. At the end of 2005, I found my first role, and it was editor. I was the editor of my first own website, built with Type 3. I was very happy. Then my colleague and I set up a intranet for our consultants, and we our task was to to introduce a knowledge management database. And so we coded a system which was built on digital asset management called DUM. It's an old module which is not in place anymore. It is now file abstraction layer. We coded our first own extension and at some point we decided, okay, we want to contribute or we want to, to provide that extension also to the TER. And so we published the extension. That was the very first time where I, I get in touch with the development. And so I attended in 2006, the second developer days in, in Swiss. It was for me a great adventure, getting in touch with all that international guys from the community. I was heated up then. <laughs> and then at, at some point, it's starting to get funny because once that extension was in the TER, some guys asked me, okay, it's a cool extension. Um, I would like to have their feature and I would, I would pay you. So I started to freelance as a developer. I introduced some additional features and then I went the journeys to the next step. I, I got a type of three developer. I got type of three administrator. I got in touch more and more with the community. Mm. Since 2009, I'm organizing the user group in Munich mm -hmm. together with Peter Kraume. I was drawn deeper and deeper into the whole system. Uh -huh. I was very proud to get also in touch with Kasper, the great guru of Typo3, because uh, at, at the former times I was also in the video team and we recorded the Typo3 conference and developer days. And so this was my first official role because then when Kasper went away, I was the head of the Typo3 video team. Hmm. And so it was the next step. 
And this was then also the step that I uh, was suggested to join the Typo 3 Association Board. And then I started to be the secretary of the board and I was organizing the elections, trying to, to improve the association organization. And then one step for another, I got drawn also into the uh, Typo 3 Org website team. And now I, I'm there where I am. I'm still in the board, I'm in the website team. I'm in the supervisory board of the company. And since 10 years now, I'm also a company owner, which is into code and we're doing only Typo 3. So I'm really living Typo 3. Wow, that's for breakfast, lunch and dinner, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, so tell me about Into Code. We started 10 years ago, uh, two friends of mine, Alexander Kellner, which is an author of um, PowerMail, which is a well-known extension, and Tina Gasteiger. She left us in the meantime because she wants to get have her family. We started the company and we are growing very fast, up to 25 employees now. And our focus universities and, uh, and B2B enterprise business. We are quite happy to, to be part of the whole story of the whole adventure. Mm. And the success of Typo 3 is our success. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in that Typo 3 will remain successful. One of the things that I care about, one of the things that I have been thinking about a lot in the last couple of years is that Typo 3 CMS is open source, it's PHP. Both of those things are very important and quite accepted in the world now. A lot of businesses and governments and universities and so on, they, they use those things. Typo 3 isn't as well known as it should be. I think it's time to get the word out again. And I think I'm hoping that someone will listen to this podcast and get inspired. There is the first book in English about Typo 3 coming out soon. Where do you think uh, Typo 3 could or should go now? Typo 3 started in, um, with Kasper in Denmark, and then somehow it spread it very fast to, to Germany and to Swiss and Austria. That is the region where we are quite very successful. In my eyes, we should look for regions where the content management is needed at all. For example, Africa is a, is a good region where we could help there getting websites online and helping the organizations to grow and to, and that they profit from our software. Yeah. Still it is a it is a dream to be also successful in North of in North America of course. Right. Um, one reason why Typo 3 isn't there that successful still is that there is maybe a different culture to set up projects for example because I think the way the projects are done with Typo 3 especially in central Europe it's very sustainable that a project is used for a very long time. A website mm. is updated, is upgraded, is refactored, but it's not built from scratch. I think in, in America, that's at least my impression, that projects are often built from scratch and are thrown away after a few years and looking uh, mm. after a few years and, and using a different tool or a different setup. This may, may not maybe fit to, to the Type of 3 approach. That's interesting. Typo 3 is, certainly has a lot of instances that have been online for 10 years and more. It is, quote unquote, hard work to set it up, but I think that it's because a lot of the system makes you do it the right way and make make choices up front. The upgrade paths have always been good, and I know that you can still take a 4.5 instance and get it through a couple, uh, you know, some work, but you can get it up to version 10 right now and add features to it. And that's that's really, really impressive. Would you say that as a matter of culture that Typo 3 has chosen sustainability as a design principle? I'm not sure if this was done by design. It just happened. I think the way that Typo 3 is like it is, is based on, on Kaspar's idea to, to have a highly customizable system which is structured in a way that it can be extended very easily. Mm. And this combination allows us to, to customize the system very well, to follow very different approaches to, to integrate solutions. This is one part of the success and one part of the hell. Like, um, <laughs> because you, you have that uh, some people compare Type 3 with a Swiss army knife where you can do many, many things with, but you have to know the tool 
to do the things right. The project is somehow made by volunteers or by contributing work done for other people back and, and needs people's time to take care of. So it's never done and it's never finished and it's never perfect, right? And the documentation could always be better. And if I take a look at the project product, which what what improvements we have made in the last years, I think we are we are heading the right path. The product is defining more and more better defaults. For example, yeah. how to how to set up a template, how to be pre-configured, so that the learning curve is getting less steep than it's uh, that it was in the past. Mm. And I think that's the right way. A system must be very easy to set up, and people must have fun to use it. I like the focus on making a backend interface that's good for the people who work in it every day for content authoring for editing for moderation and approvals you know i i really really appreciate how that's how the structures support that one of the big advantages of type 3 is that it has a kind of abstract view on data that that you can use the list module to 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 identify and and work with different data types but you don't have to extend the system the core system um, with own views in the back end Mm. You can edit a calendar entry, a news entry, but you, you can, any type of, of record type can be edited through the, through the back end very efficiently. And uh, I think this is one of the big advantages of, of Type 3. Because it manages content well? <laughs> good. <Yeah. laughs> it's good that it does, right? <laughs> yeah. I think we, we need to put a lot of effort in, in the next years into the documentation and into the onboarding of, uh, of a more international community. Mm. Um, I, I think that that is the key to, to stay successful and also to get more growth in, into our community. The Type 3 Association is, is trying to push that topic in, on, onto different levels we uh, try to organize for example this year's the outreach sprint concept due to corona it did not happen would have been very cool but maybe next year hopefully we'll be able to see each other again in person have you been involved in the mentoring at all this year yes i'm uh, involved in during my board work it's not at my responsibility area but uh, of course i'm informed and uh, i think that's a great way to spread the word about type 3 and also help uh, students around the world to uh, improve their life and uh, their work and uh, work possibilities career possibilities so we're testing out at this phase of the podcast we're just getting rolling the recording the first conversation so we're testing out this tagline where it's the type 3 community podcast your stories, your projects, the difference you make. And I love in open source that we've built and given ourselves tools and all of our friends and predecessors have given us so much to work with that can help people communicate, build community, give themselves career opportunities, change their economic fortunes. And it's, it's, it's such an empowering feeling. And I, I love to see people from different places and different backgrounds coming and discovering it. And I don't just mean, for, mean, for example, what the Bites for Babes in South Africa who are using Typo3, which is a fantastic thing that people should be looking at. It's really cool. And I'm hoping I can meet them sometime. But I know a woman who was a career changer in her mid or late 50s who became a developer and works as a, def a professional developer using open source software because people were generous enough to share the documentation, to do videos online, because she Everybody in the West more or less has a computer now and more or less has access to the internet. And she could go and make something of herself at at a phase in her life when, when you know, that would have been considered unusual in the past. You know, I met in Austria, I met a Joomla contributor who won the community award a few years ago. And, and she was also in her, I think she was in her 70s. And she had answered something like 6,000 support questions in their forums. And it's just what she does. And it's so empowering to, to, to make a difference in the world. That is the good thing of open source and a positive community that you have the freedom to do everything. Once you understand that construct, you can do everything in, a com in an open source project. You have, you have much more fun because some people are, are, are thinking they have to wait for, um, for allowance to do something. 
I think it's the opposite. You can just do it. If someone doesn't like it, it can be reverted. Mm -hmm. So Oh, I see. Yeah, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I know the Type of 3 community now for 15 years. In, in that time, a, a lot of things shifted because uh, 15 years ago, there was less competitors at the market. Um, the whole the whole ecosystem was not that professionalized. Companies weren't that big. Everything was a bit smaller. Many stories uh, appeared in that decade. For example, we had that uh, story with Neos and uh, two two products in parallel, mm. and a lot of confusion about the future of Typo Three. But everything worked works now very well, and I think we are on the right way. But it's a different situation now. As I, as I told you, everything is professionalizing now. And that's also a reason why the Type 3 Association made the plan five years ago to, to set up a company which is taking um, now a lot of operational work for us now and also ensures us the financial contribution for, for the whole Type 3 project. Right. That change is, is now, I think, is also necessary in, in the Type 3 community that we need to introduce some governance to allow us to lead the, the community also into the future. Mm. That's a big challenge for the next years because the more the community is growing, the more conflicts you have to solve and the more challenging it is to, to keep the good spirit. Yep, and there's a concept where people say you should write contracts in the good times so that you're prepared for the bad times. And I think it's important as the community is growing and as the potential damage is growing because more and more people rely on Typo 3 economically, more and more people do their work, more and more companies have their infrastructure on it, right? If something goes wrong, the damage is, is potentially much greater. I think it's really important to focus on preparing structures and processes that can also scale and not just focusing on a particular incident or a particular small problem, but looking at what could have helped avoid that or, or how can we deal with things in principle in the future so that we have patterns ready, so that we're ready for that sort of thing. Preparing for more growth and more success, more and Im ever improving onboarding experiences for new users is great. There's some good training material out there. I think it's a problem that there's a lot of outdated technical information online for older versions, and I wish we yes. could learn how to clean that up. I think sharing our successes is a good idea. And I think that something else that people should, could help people choose to be part of this is the community structure, the Typo3 project is, in my experience, organized in a really smart way that I think is a shining example that, that other people could follow and maybe a reason to come in. There is a community and a, and a vibrant community of professionals. It's focused a lot around agencies and delivering client websites as a fundamental mission of the technology. And then it has a nonprofit association that, in my view, has done a very good job of taking care of the community and making the best decisions it could and building structures for events and so on. So a solid nonprofit, like a lot of projects have, and a really solid community of people who are genuinely nice and welcoming and smart. And that decision that you took five years ago with the community, with the association, to build a commercial arm as a 100% subsidiary of the association and to represent the community and by its actual Articles of incorporation, the rules that govern the country by law, it cannot, must not, will not compete with anything anyone in the community does. And it's there to negotiate and to build partnerships with industries to represent the community, to be able to show up and have, have conversations at eye level with much larger and non-open source organizations. I think that's an incredibly smart move. It's been running now since 2016, 2017? Yes. So I know that it's profitable, which means that it can sustain itself. So it must have been a good idea. And you say it's contributing back to the project. How do you think that's going? What's, what's next? In the first one or two years, the company had a phase of setting up and finding also their mission and vision. We had a business plan, which was focusing on, on, on different projects. And I think since since this year at, at latest, we, we now where we are heading to, 
we have a strong product for the company, which is the so-called uh, ELTS, the extended long-term support, which provides us uh, a lot of financial uh, contribution to the project. The next step is now that the company is taking over the processes of the Type 3 Association, like um, setting up the a proper e-commerce system for managing the memberships or the partner program, which is now the professional service listing. We have a merchandising shop. I think more products in that way will come so that the company will provide us a financial profit for the project. And in this mm. year, we can um, have some advantages of, of that construction. For example, the, the company will now be able to raise the core budget from 350,000 to 500,000 euro. So this is a direct contribution for the Type 3 project, which will help our project and the community and the product quality. Nice. It's great. Growing, developing, moving in the right direction. Sounds really good. What is the coolest thing that you ever built with Typo3? It's always the first baby you have, the first love. And this was my extension, which, which I built with my colleague, the knowledge database, where you were able to, to select uh, PDF doc documents by uh, combining different search parameters, which a project where, where I was very proud of. So, so, so you could you could you could set parameters to search for data points, and then they were turned into PDFs. Is that right? No. Uh, or the information a... was pulled from PDFs and turned into data. Yes. That's pretty cool. Ten points for Hufflepuff for that one. What are your favorite features of Typo Three? I think I love the, the abstract data view for for more or less the TCA because you can you the can table find... configuration array. Yes, thank you. You can define a different set set on data items, and TCA is rendering the TCE table configuration engine is rendering the TCE forms um, is rendering <laughs> is rendering the TCA definition. So uh, yeah, I, you know I'm a structured guy, and I I, I, I love the structured data. <laughs> okay, so we'll just write. Typo 3's approach to structured data because I saw your eyes light up and how you were just going to fully geek out on like, well, you see, actually the TCE takes the part of menu and then renders and then if you take the variables on the, which is great. And Typo 3 is all about that stuff. And that's that's where it all comes from in the end. What should everyone know about Typo 3? That I think we have the greatest community on earth. Okay. And what's something that people generally don't know about Typo 3 that maybe they should? Many people think Type 3 is very complicated. In fact, I think it isn't because Type 3 is very structured, as I told you before. And the main concept of Type 3 is the page tree, where somehow everything is organized via that tree. And maybe that's the reason why it is successful in Germany, because the Germans like to structure everything. And Type 3 is, is a structured system. Right. So I love that approach of the tree, where you can organize your data in a very visual way visual way, you see in the back end, the navigation structure in the front end. And, and that's, I think that is a, a huge advantage. I am a big fan of the hierarchical organization of the page tree and some of the tricks it does. Did you know that there is the crazy tree limiter inside? That's yeah. A, there's a variable called crazy tree limiter, a crazy tree limiter, and uh, it is set to 9,999. 9, so the page tree has a maximum recursion level of 9,999. 9, now, from a UX perspective, if your website has 10,000 minus one levels of information architecture, I think you're probably doing it wrong. But maybe that'll be useful when Typo3 is dealing with machine learning recursion data sets or something uh, in the future. So good to know. Thank you. That's a cool bit of tri trivia. That could go on the trivia night pretty well. But, but it, could be, it could be that my knowledge is outdated. So it was... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it, I Asking the audience that. in our comments on the blog post on this or the, the episode where you're hearing it or to us on Twitter, crazy tree limiter variable... Is it still 9,999 into 2020? <laughs> Going back to the thing that you said before, when you said, well, maybe that's why it's so popular in Germany because it's so organized. So the old Typo3 community motto was inspiring people to share, right? What if we change it to 
Typo 3 Ordnung muss sein. <lacht> I think it would fit. <lacht> I think then we would limit this success finally only to Germany. <laughs> okay. You have contributed a great deal to Typo 3, starting with finding it and starting to use it in 2004, and then writing your own extension, going through being on the video team, on the association board, starting your own company, helping presumably hundreds of clients along the way. Tell us about a time that the community helped you? Oh, I think uh, they, they helped me a lot of times, especially I learned so much from the community um, about technology, about ideas, approaches, which I was able to, to introduce in my company. For example, one, one big thing was, was the whole continuous integration with GitLab. I was learning in the Type 3 org website team And so I was able to carry a lot of best practices into my company. And that, that's the thing which I can recommend everyone contribute, build up your own network and learn. Mm. Give and get. Stefan Busemann, your feature request for Typo 311, what is it? Or Typo 315? <laughs> I would love to see a better experience for editors in regards to the file management that uh, people are able to, to look for, for assets via categories that they can have a more powerful search. At the moment, you have to know the folder where a file is stored mm. or you, can have, you have a simple full text search, but it's not powerful. I want, to, I want to use categories. I want to have the possibility to have a big uh, preview image of, of assets. Okay. And that would be my greatest wish. And that would be incredibly helpful. And I think it would match people's everyday expectations of how, how things work on the web today and how things on their phones work today. So that makes total sense. And we know it's well within reach. We know the pieces that we can put together to make that happen. So, okay. So that seems like a, a valid topic for the next couple of sprints. We can pass that on to Benny Mack to make sure that he gets his marching orders, so to speak. In a normal year, if someone wanted to come and contribute, I would say, hey, go to typo3.org, find out where the next sprint is, get in touch with the teams doing it. They'll help you find a place to stay. And, and, and you can go and do this in September or wherever in Bad Homburg or Munich or Hamburg or Spain or whatever it is. How can I find and join contribution activities as of late 2020? And how do I, how do I join a sprint? In 2019, it was very easy because uh, we had regular open sprints, which we announced uh, at typosuite.org and at the social channels. In, in 2020, it was much different because uh, we, we, had to on, we had to try to onboard people uh, remotely, which was happening and, and it was quite the same way that we uh, introduced that, uh, we announced that sprints on typosuite.org. And we try to use also the social media to announce sprints. And then we had a up link where people could um, enter their names into uh, a note where they can find the channels where they can reach out for mm. the teams, for example, the Discord or the Slack channels yeah. uh, where they can get in touch. But I think this is an important topic. I see there is also a lot of room for improvement. And this should be uh, one of the most important projects for 2021 that we improve the onboarding experience and improve the onboarding documentation make it easier to to get in touch with people and teams and really take into account now that not everyone can show up in person every time and it doesn't yeah. matter if that's because they're in an interesting place or because none of us can travel, right? I think that that's probably an, an, an accessibility and an equality issue that could really help us enrich the pool of contributors that, that can come to us. I think another important aspect which everyone should know is that you don't have to be a, a programmer to, to contribute. For example, I'm a very poor programmer. My colleagues hate me if I start coding PHP. Uh, a lot of, I know a lot of old stuff. So very well, old versions of Typo 3, I can be very helpful. But uh, newer versions, I'm, I'm not the best uh, colleague to, to ask. But there are so many different levels where you, where you can uh, contribute to the project. For example, I think in, in, within the next two weeks, there will be a marketing sprint where, where people 
who who have just uh, great ideas for marketeers, they can attend there. We are always looking for people who are willing to contribute to the board for the association, people who, who, who like to steer an organization and improve the processes in our organization. And there are many other examples where you could contribute without being a programmer. Right. And so on the technical side, of course, developers and programmers have a lot of opportunities in the Typo3 core or maybe with Andre Steiner on the server team or all of that infrastructure stuff and all of the actual project, of course. The community itself has a number of groups that make it easier to contribute because they're directed at specific activities. The marketing group you mentioned, there's a communications group, which not only puts out the Typo3 newsletter, but if you want to write something that's related to Typo3 and you're not the best writer, they actually have a process for helping you get your blog post together and maybe getting it on typo3.org, for example, which is which is interesting. There's a design group, and then there've been special groups set up for particular projects over the years. So there, there are a ton of really, really interesting activities. And 2020 is so dominating, right? But like normally I would say, is there a local user group in your town if yes, go there and hang out. And then if it makes sense, you help organize it next time or you bring sandwiches or whatever. I think the modern version of that is a little bit different and who knows what it's going to look like next year. But anything that you can do with or to help humans can become relevant in this space too. Another important project which we are actively working on is uh, the Visualized Contribution Project. It's the aim to make the contribution of many people more prominent. Mm. For example, the company introduced the Developer Appreciation Day. And in the past, it, there were only the core developers mentioned with their commits. Nowadays, we have also included the Typo3 documentation improvements, improvers, and uh, the Typo3 org website improvers. And at that level, we want to start to make the contribution of individuals more transparent. On the other level, we want also to provide a benefit to companies who send their employees to contribute and provide them, for example, a benefit that they will get end up in a ranking higher than mm. other companies who do mm. not contribute. Yeah. When you and I started in open source, it was all developers all the time for developers. And of course, contribution meant literally only code. And it made perfect sense to give people contrib credits for patches and so on. And because we have become a whole economy, a whole, a whole community, and there are lawyers and there are business people and there are designers, uh, it's it's hard to put a specific value on a thing that someone does, but it's important to recognize and remember that everyone is needed to make the rich, vibrant group that we have supporting these activities. And here I'll try a trick now. It's important to remember that your stories and your projects are how you can make a difference in the world, right? Yeah. On that note, that feels like a perfect place to say thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me today and, and sharing your experiences. And thank you so much for all of your contributions and, and inspirations over the years. It's really, really great. Thank you so much. Many thanks. Thanks to the Typo3 Association for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, B13 and Stephanie Kreutzer for our logo. Merci beaucoup, Patrick Gaumont, Typo3 developer and musician extraordinaire for our theme music. Thanks again to today's guest, if you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe in the podcast app of your choice and share Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast, with your friends and colleagues. If you didn't like it, please share it with your enemies. Would you like to play along and suggest a guest for the podcast? Do you have questions or comments? Reach out to us on Twitter at Typo3Podcast. You can find show notes, links, and more information in our posts on Typo3.org. Remember, open source software would not be what it is without you. Thank you all for your contributions. Okay, I start. Hi, I'm Stefan Busemann, and sorry, I, I cannot remember that. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I got it wrong as well. I'm going to put it in the chat in Zoom. Hold on. Um, and this can go into the outtakes, of course. Um, um, hi, I'm, you can remember this part, Stefan Busemann. Welcome to application.
that we're trying that as the name application. The Typo3 Community Podcast. Podcast. Um, and then wait a second and then say your stories, your projects, the difference you make. Okay. Do you see that in the chat? Do you see that in the chat there? I try to read it. <laughs> I, I still need no glasses. <laughs> really? <laughs> I have I have glasses everywhere. It's terrible. <laughs> Stefan was showing us his really super beautiful office and boardroom, which I think is kind of, I mean, I wonder, it could also be sort of going to waste this year because. <sighs> yeah, a lot of people are working at home mm. these days. Uh, so it's a pity to have a beautiful office and nobody is, uh, is using it. Yeah. The, the office was uh, always a crucial part of our company. When we founded our company 10 years ago, we had uh, a very small office, I think only 28 square meters. And then uh, in 2012, only two years after we started, we decided to move on to a large office with, with over 400 square meters. So it was a huge investment for, for our young company by having not 8,000 euros uh, per, per, per year, but uh, 64,000 euro per year. So of, of rent? But, of rent, yes. But uh, I think it's worth it and it's marketing in, 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 on, on a different level. First of all, our, our employees uh, should have a, a beautiful place to work where they have fun and where they want to be there because it's, it's nice. They must feel comfortable. The second thing is that we want to, to show to our customer that we are a high level company. And the third of them, if we want to get new customers, they should be somehow impressed of, of, mm. of the office and uh, of the work we invested there. That's an interesting challenge. I have been involved in American companies trying to start business in Europe. And I have myself helped a company start getting into Scandinavia. It's hard for people outside of Europe to understand that this European Union is just not one big economy where all the rules are, are the same always. And so for Americans, somehow doing business on the phone is totally normal. And I know I know salespeople who like sell $100,000 of services on the phone, right? And it's fine. A couple of phone calls, get it done. Cool. In Germany, you need to have that lovely table with your logo shining out of the middle of it in the super modern renovated antique building that you're in like you like you said you it helps if you can impress them and uh, give them a nice cup of coffee and and that sort of thing and that feels old fashioned from the outside but relationships are really really important here so in germany i think you need to meet in person a couple of times and get a feeling for each other but i believe that once a commercial relationship is is established in Germany that there's a lot of trust and maybe more trust than an American relationship. I think the assumption of, of the relationship is deeper here. Uh, I don't think you can sell 5,000 euros of services without maybe going out to dinner twice. So they need even more sort of TLC. The bigger motivation was to, to impress our customers or potential customers. But during the years, it shifted for me for me, the employees are getting much more important than the customers because the employees are our real value because they do the work, they need the creativity and they must feel happy at the work. And the work is, is a, a big important part of our life. We are spending maybe 20 to 30% of our life during the year in the, in the office. So the office must be the place where you want to be happy being a multicultural person and believing that people from a lot of different places could be listening to us. That's also such a, a German perspective, you know, oh, I spend 30% of my, of, of my time in the office, especially on the, in the United States, that's like half your life, 60% of your life, 80% of your life, people 
for the longest time, there was a huge focus on how much time you're there and who comes first and who leaves last and all of those things that have nothing to do with actual value and productivity. And I wonder, on the one hand, I think someone said that Europeans identify with their families and their hobbies first and Anglo-Saxons, so English uh, uh, um, Americans, at least English speakers, identify themselves with their work first and with all of us being forced to work at home and managers being forced to look at the value of what the employees are delivering. I think that's a very normal concept for those of us who work in in open source and in and in IT. And a lot of us have worked remote for a long time. But I think that maybe there's a chance to really focus to value delivery and and a more human culture somehow. These days with with this corona situation moves the whole story into that direction because mostly people are working remote now and you 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 don't have the control you have to trust your your employees that they deliver and they are measured by the, the things they deliver for for us it was always important to say that we we want to limit the hours of work per week no one should work more than 40 hours a week we don't pay any extra hour because we we think and we are sure that creativity needs also time for to rest it, it's mm. important that you have enough spare time and we, we don't want to have any races who stays the longest uh, in, mm. in the office for myself especially in 2020 so in real time we are talking later in 2020 this year's been incredibly stressful and at open strategy partners where i work it was the right time to focus on operations and the right time to focus on process and delivery because I found I had absolutely no energy for creativity. There were no new ideas flowing. It was really, really hard. And like I said, I thought I knew remote work. I've done that a long time, but this this was another level of of isolation and and stress and so on. And now things are a little better and and things at our company are going well. And I'm finding creative energy again. You know, I, I, I had the chance to take some time off. I think it's absolutely right. And I think working at home, people are tempted. I know I used to like, oh, after dinner, I'm just gonna check that one email that I wanted to look at. And then all of a sudden it's one in the morning and that's terrible. So I think we have to probably turn around and give our employees that same, or our colleagues, our friends, that same coaching and recommendation, even when they're not in the building, right? Because there's a risk that, especially if you like what you do, right? That's always the hard part. And and in, in the special case of open source work, the work and the hobbies are always starting to mix up. So where's the border where you start working, uh, where you end working for the company, where's the start of the contribution to, for the project? So this is always... Uh, bit to, to differentiate, hmm. a bit hard to differentiate. What we introduced in the company this year were coding nights, where we, we want to provide an offer to our employees that they can use the creativity at night, at one first, the first uh, Thursday in the, mo- in the month. We, we stay um, on a voluntary base in the company and we, we code together. We try to find two or three topics. Maybe one is an improvement for the company for a company tool. And maybe a second is um, contributing to, to Typo 3, to a project. And there it, it's, the boundaries are, are not that hard. So at some point you start working for the company and at some point you start doing yourself to contribute to the project. You talked about the sort of do something for the company, do something for open source. We know it doesn't happen every day in every project, but I think we're also really, really lucky in open source. We have these amazing tools that friends and acquaintances and people before us who we've never met have invested millions of hours of coding and and brilliant ideas into the tool we start working with for a client project. When, when that client needs something that we've never done before, or there's something new in the world, we get the chance to build that and feed our families, right? And have nice colleagues. And in the best case, we get to give that back as well. If it's a functionality that's going to be, that's, that's going to be relevant to other people, you know, then you can actually spend that coding night, like polishing up the client feature and then abstracting it out into the, into the meta case and giving it back to everyone. I love that. And this year was was also a challenge for the open source teams. As you may know, I'm contributing to the Typo3 org website team. 
in the past, it was always a good behavior to, to attend a sprint, mm. to travel to a town and having two or three nice days working focused on, on the project sure. and then traveling back. This wasn't happening this year. We were not able to, to travel. We, we, we should stay at home. And so it was also for us, for, for, for the project, a new challenge to coordinate remote sprints, remote nights, and motivate people to contribute, not in a focused way. Because if you're at home, you get uh, dis disturbed by, by the family or not disturbed. Uh, there are a lot of other possibilities to, to do at, at the evening. So it's maybe not the first option to, to contribute to, to an open source project. This was also uh, a new experience to motivate people that they still contribute to the, mm. uh, to the project. And um, we managed it by introducing the remote days, having a, a fixed day in the month. It's the 15th of the month where we are having our remote night. Ah. And uh, so we were able to bring also the project to, to the next level by upgrading Typo3 to version 10 the Typo3 org website or extension repository to version 10. I like that Typo3 is running the most current version of itself. I think that's always a good sign for a project. And from my experience of years of user groups and, and that sort of thing, it is definitely easier for people to join and, and be successful if they know it's always the first Thursday, it's always the 15th, it's always yeah. whatever. And nobody has to think where or how or when, and that part of the decision-making is taken care of. That's cool. At our company, we've spent quite a lot of time figuring out how to turn our in-person workshops into online workshops. And most of them can be done. And I think we're starting to succeed with them as well. But it's been a really interesting challenge. How does a sprint, right? How does a coding um, community contribution event look different when you're online? Let's start with the things I miss, which I do miss most. That's the personal relationship sitting next to the desk to each other, shout through the room and ask other people for help. That is not that easy because you have always to set up a, a dedicated phone call or a video call. It's not possible to get that feelings uh, through that kind of channel. That is a challenge. What works quite well is if issues or, or tasks are prepared very well, that people can, can work on them coordinated. So we, we introduced a complete remote sprint where we said we have a stand-up in the morning, a stand-up in, in the afternoon, and a stand-up in the evening, where we meet at, at, at a fixed time and where we talk to each other what, what, we, have, what we achieved during the day. What helped also a lot was a different tool you know, maybe most of the community uses at the moment Slack for communicating. In for that sprint, we were using Discord, which has a, a similar approach, but some some uh, things are, are organized in a bit different way. For example, that you have that room concept where people can uh, join a room and switch rooms, and you, you see also who is currently in a room. Oh, so nice. that is also a good concept. You could also sort of do the the topic by table concept of sprints where you have yes. the, the multilingual room and the performance room and the version 10 upgrade room, and yes. I can see them and choose where I want to be. That's fantastic. Discord is also designed to work well in lower bandwidth situations, which is probably helpful. What I learned this year is that there is no perfect tool mm. for audio and video. I don't know how many tools I've used this year for video um, calls. I'm still looking for the perfect one. For me, the perfect one would be one which does not use much CPU consumption because you don't want to have a heater at your desk. <laughs> what I see also, which, which harms the, the project and the community, is somehow if, if we um, using that walled garden like Slack, where much of the communication is just within the tool. It's not visible to the outside. It's locked in. You can't find that communication and discussions on the internet. So and they also they can yeah. disappear, and it's that makes it harder so for in the my future. Eyes, it's always light and shadow, but for for us, for the teamwork, Slack and Discord and uh, other real time communication is is really good for coordinating the work remotely. Mm -hmm. But it's not very sustainable in, in regards of visibility to to what's Google, for example. Yeah.